right. Well, I always have a reason to dance with that countdown music, but today, especially show because we've got a very exciting and unique program for everybody. I'm going to explain a little bit more about that in a minute, but I just want to note for anyone who's new to us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants that we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. We've got, I think, 60 broadcasts between now and the end of the run in mid-June. It's going to be Bedlam and Insanity and so much fun, and we are so thrilled every time you join us as we get to share these incredible stories stories of scientists, educators, conservationists around the globe. So a big thank you to all of you. Today I'm really excited. We've got some people in Illinois, Michigan. We've got Ontario, BC, Alberta, more. It's a really nice diverse audience uh, and you guys are in for a real treat. I will note before we get underway, we will have a Kahoot today. So if you want to pull this up in a separate tab on your computer on YouTube, on StreamYard, play along with us. We're going to have a three question quiz between our talk and Q&A portions. I'd love to have you guys take part today. Certainly a lot of fun. Now today we are going to dive in with a book birthday party. It's our first ever book birthday party, really. I, as you can see with our, our speaker, Lindsay, she's got like all the stuff. She's got all the balloons, the hats. We've got the, the fetid book itself. This is very, it's a very, we've got multiple copies of it. It is literally, it's opening day. It's release day for Polar, Lindsay, which is like, how long? Okay, I'm going to preempt a question, and I should I should let kids do this. How long does it take to bring a book to light? Like, how long did you work on this? We are going to talk about that in just a moment when we bring up the slides. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I won't spoil it then, but today we are going to dive in with this incredible book, Polar, highlighting mm -hmm. the most unique and amazing ecosystems on this planet, the Arctic and the Antarctic, the incredible wildlife that they have there. A lot of our kids have been obsessed this year with polar bears and penguins, but we're going to talk about not just the iconic wildlife, but some of the more obscure and strange things. And so, Lindsay, I'm going to stop talking. It's all about you. I'm so excited to hear about your book. And without further ado, take us away on this journey about Antarctic adaptations, a book birthday party. Yay! Awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse, for having me here today. And thank you for everybody who is joining us. I am so excited. Um, to be here today celebrating the release of my 23rd science book for young readers, Polar, Wildlife at the Ends of the Earth, 23rd in 2023. That wasn't planned at all. It's just a fun little coincidence. <laughs> so we're going to be digging into some of the amazing animal facts that I learned when I was researching this book. But before we do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about the question that everybody always asks writers, and that is this question where do you get your ideas from? So this is a picture of me and my younger brother. Um, it was 1989, so please don't judge my fashion choices. <laughs> I was very cool back in the day. Um, that was the year that my family moved to Yellowknife in Canada's Northwest Territories. I was in grade six, and I've been lucky enough to go to a lot of really beautiful places in the world, but something about this particular beauty really got into my heart and my soul. I just love the water and the rocks and these tiny little trees clinging on at the northernmost edge of the boreal forest. And I love this landscape and the animals that live there so much that when my family moved back down south and I got a little older, I went to university to study polar wildlife. And while I was doing research for my PhD, I discovered brand new things about northern wolves and Arctic foxes that no one had ever known before, which was really amazing. But then I realized that I actually wanted to go back to my childhood dream of being a writer instead of being a professional scientist. And after this experience of living in the North and studying the North, it's probably not too surprising that my very first book idea was to write a book about Arctic adaptations. Now, it took me 22 other books to become a good enough writer to write this book. And part of that process of becoming a better writer and thinking about my idea was realizing that the book needed to be about animals at both of the poles, the Arctic and Antarctica at the same time. So let's talk a little bit about what goes into making a book. Uh, you've got some before and after pictures on your screen here. So on the left-hand side, that's a picture of my office and those piles of paper that you see all over the floor and all over my desk are printouts of research reports that were written by polar scientists, the things that I was reading to learn more about the Arctic and Antarctica so that I could put them in my book. Just as a side note, I don't print my research anymore. I have two monitors now, so I can do everything digitally. That's much better for the environment. How many sources did I use, you ask? 339. 
I used 339 different sources of information while I was researching this book. I took 95,569 words of notes from all that stuff that I was reading. And the final book contains 9,119 words. That's about 10%. And that's actually pretty typical for me and my writing process. I like to say that a book is like an iceberg. 90% of what's there is actually happening underneath the surface and only about 10% is happening on the page. Now you can imagine if 90% of what I wrote down didn't go into the book, there was a lot of really, really cool information that I had to cut. We're gonna talk about some of those deleted scenes in a little while. Uh, but first, going back to Jesse's question, I did seven drafts of this book with my editor, where my editor and I were going back and forth and discussing every scene, every sentence, every single word on that page, trying to make it the best it could possibly be. I did a whole bunch more drafts all by myself that I didn't show her. I didn't count those, so I have no idea how many there were. But I do know that it took four years to write this book. I started working on it in the spring of 2019 and here we are in the spring of 2023, and it is finally a real book that you can hold in your hands. So after all of that time and work, you can imagine how excited I am to actually have this book be a real book. And it's out here today. I'm about to transition into cool science facts about wildlife, but I just wanted to pause for a moment and see if anybody has any questions at this time. Any questions about writing or books or research or any of that before we go on well youtubers you're welcome to chime in there stream nerd if you guys have any questions that you want to share in the chat you absolutely can and of course if you can't think of them now but you think of them later we will have a really long big nice q a at the end whether it's animals you want to hear about books you want to hear about or more um i'm curious Lindsay. Is this, I mean, you, you highlighted this very personal connection to this book. Um, is there another book? So we're going to highlight Polar. We're going to make sure everyone has all the things about Polar at the end of this broadcast that they ever wanted more. Is there another book that was comparably uh, exciting or challenging for you that you've ever had the chance to write that we could feature as well? We want to get people buying all your books, basically. Oh, well, jump <laughs> that would be amazing if they wanted to. You may have noticed that in the very back corner of uh, the screen here, there's a, um, my previous book. Uh, my 22nd book, The Boreal Forest. Um, and that was also a very important and wonderful book for me because when I went to university, I went to the University of Alberta. And of course, Alberta in Edmonton is in the Boreal Forest. So that is also a landscape that I love. And uh, I had a lot of fun researching that book too. So. Uh, we did have one quick question that I'll pass along from Yuna and Africa West. They want to know how you got the idea for your book. So specifically, I mean, you highlighted a little bit of your backdrop in Yellowknife, which, by the way, is one of the most amazing, wonderful places in the world that I've ever had the chance to visit. Everybody should go to Yellowknife. It's spectacular. Um, but anything else that you want to highlight before we dive <laughs> on with our cool science facts? <laughs> yeah, I think I would just say that I tend to think about my ideas quite a long time before I am ready to bring them into a book format. So I get an idea and I think, hey, that's kind of interesting. And then I read a bunch of things and I think about things and something else kind of connects and things just sort of accumulate a little bit organically. Um, so it's not, for me, it's not one of those things where, you know, the, the idea arrives fully formed and I'm ready to go, I have to spend a lot of time thinking about it and working on it um, before I, um, I can really get it to the point where I'm like, okay, this is what's gonna be in the book. Um, I see a second question has popped up here. Um, have I discovered anything surprising in the research? Oh, we're about to get to that stuff. Don't you worry. <laughs> Let's dive in, Lindsay. I'm so excited to hear all about these cool animals and more. Yeah, time for animals. Okay, we're gonna move on to some of the amazing animal facts that I learned while researching this book. But first of all, we're going to back up and we're going to talk about what is an adaptation. I said that this book is about the adaptations that are at work in the Arctic and Antarctica. So we need to know what an adaptation is. So an adaptation is a body part, a body function, or a behavior that helps a life form survive in its habitat. And that match between the life form and its habitat is really important. I'm going to give you a quick example, okay? So both fish and humans need oxygen to survive. 
oxygen is used by our bodies to turn the food that we eat into energy. So lungs are an adaptation for getting the oxygen out of the air. Gills are an adaptation for getting the oxygen out of the water. But if you put a fish in the air or you put a human under water, they're not gonna be able to survive real well, right? Those adaptations are no longer working because they're no longer matched to their habitat. So let's talk about habitat. The polar regions, the Arctic and Antarctica, are some of the most challenging habitats for life forms that are anywhere on the planet. So a question for all of you watching today, what do you think are some of the challenges of these polar habitats that life forms might have to overcome? I'll get you to uh, pop some ideas in the chat here. What are some of the things that the animals in these areas might have to overcome? That's an Arctic ground squirrel on the screen there, just in case you're wondering while you're chatting. Type I actually, there's some, uh, there's some classes that have their hands up and I can come into them live actually, Lindy. So Miss Fisher's oh. class, Personville, what are some yeah. challenges that some of these people have to face? I know, I know how to tickle that. Um, we, we were thinking that with the cold weather, they might have to deal with that. We talked a lot about blubber in our class. This year. Nice. <laughs> Excellent. Cold weather. Absolutely. It is very cold. Anything else you can all think of? At Glenview, grade fours. What do you guys think? What do you think? What do you think, guys? What's what challenges are there? Um, we, I heard cold weather, Julian. Um, Frostbite, hypothermia, Yuna. Mm -hmm. uh, wind, wind, <laughs> predator. Predators, these are great, everybody. So, okay, cold is our abiding factor, which I think we're going to give them a lot of cold stuff, Lindsay. Absolutely. That is an excellent, excellent answer and one that animals definitely need to deal with. Okay, so uh, we're going to play a little game here. We're going to vote on which of these habitats you think is the winner, okay? So I live in the Northern Hemisphere, which means that for me, North is always up. <laughs> So if you want to vote for the Arctic, I want you to put your thumbs up. If you're going to vote for Antarctica, put your thumbs down towards the south, or you can type your answer in the chat, okay? So which of these two habitats do you think is the coldest? Thumbs up for the Arctic, thumbs down for Antarctica in the south. Jesse's voting for Antarctica. What does everybody else think? We got, what do we got? Miss Fisher's class, thumbs up, thumbs down. Oh. Bit, bit of both. Well, I, I see a bit of both. I like it. <laughs> okay. Um, Antarctica is the winner. They are the coldest. Okay. The coldest temperature ever recorded on the planet Earth was recorded in Antarctica. It was minus 89 degrees Celsius. So just to give you an idea, at minus 50 degrees Celsius, exposed human skin will freeze in two minutes. So minus 89 is crazy amazingly cold, so cold you can't even comprehend that. Okay, next one. Which of these two habitats do you think is the windiest? Thumbs up for the Arctic, thumbs down for Antarctica. Which one's the windiest? Ooh, Glenview, what do you think, grade fours? I'm saying thumbs down here. Thumbs down, Antarctica is the windiest, okay. Antarctica, okay, yes. You guys are so good at this. I knew you would be. The fastest winds of these two habitats were recorded in Antarctica. It was 327 kilometers per hour. For reference, a category five hurricane is 252 kilometers and up. Coincidentally, 252 kilometers per hour is the highest wind speed that's ever been recorded in the Arctic. But to be fair, that's when the wind gauge blew away. <laughs> so it might have gotten windier than that, and we just don't know about it. <laughs> All right, one more. And that is, which of these two habitats do you think gets the most snow? Thumbs up for the Arctic, thumbs down for Antarctica. Which one gets the most snow? Is it going to be a clean sweep for Antarctica, just killing it in the Battle of the Poles? Or what do we think? Saturna Island, Gem Chicago, if you guys want to chime in in the chat as well, Miss Fisher. What do you guys think? Yeah. Up, 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 Arctic, Arctic from Africa West too. Arctic is oh. the next for everybody. Hey. You guys are so good at this. Yeah, the Arctic gets the most snow. So it can be up to 140 centimeters per winter. That's about the height of an average nine-year-old. In contrast, in Antarctica, it's about 13 centimeters per winter, which is just enough to trickle over the top of your snow boot. Okay. 
You all did so well with this. This was a great game. So we are going to play another game. We are going to try to identify an iconic polar animal by its adaptation. This is the first one. This is the adaptation. I want you to tell me what animal you think this comes from in the chat or on screen, whatever works best. All right. I know we got a couple of classes with the devices off, but if you guys want to chime in, in the chat, please do uh, in BC and Chicago, respectively. Mm -hmm. Avoca West, what's the animal from? What is this from? Arctic fox. Arctic fox. Interesting. Not the answer I would have suspected. Miss Fisher's class? Arctic fox. <laughs> and I just saw polar bear pop up in the chat. I was positive I would trick you all and it would be a polar bear. It is not the polar bear. It's the Arctic fox. You guys are amazing. <laughs> so what we are looking at here is that very thick, warm, insulative fur that helps keep the fox's body heat against its body so that it doesn't escape out into that cold Arctic air. Um, cool things about the Arctic foxes, that fur is actually performing a second function. It's giving it another adaptation. Does anybody want to guess what the second adaptation is represented by that fur? Ooh. Uh, Glenview, what do we think? What, what do you say was the answer? Camouflage. 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 Oh, fantastic. You guys are so good at this. I love it. Yeah. So that fur is white. It's helping to blend that fox into its background, which is a really useful adaptation to have if you're a predator and you've got to sneak up on your prey, right? Now, here's a cool thing about Arctic foxes. They're the only member of the dog family that changes their fur color with the seasons. In the summer, they actually change to a brownish color, so they're blending in with the rocks. They are also the only member of the dog family that has fur on their toe beans as well as in between their toes, which helps to protect their feet when they're walking around on the snow and the ice. Now, foxes also have a behavioral adaptation for dealing with that cold weather. When it's really bad, when it's really, really cold and windy, they have been known to take naps inside the hollowed out carcasses of reindeer. It's a little bit like Luke Skywalker in the Tauntaun. It's super gross. So awesome. <laughs> awesome. So awesome. <laughs> I'm distracting from the kids in the program. We'll talk later. Okay. Next one. This is another adaptation. What animal do you think this comes from? Which polar animal has this adaptation? Ooh, what a weird thing that is. Miss Fisher's class, what do we think? Tiger, 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 tiger. I'm hearing tigers. I see Arctic hare in the chat. Um, Arctic hares have a very similar adaptation to this animal that does the same thing, that provides that same function. Um, and you were also on the right track with tigers, by the way. It is a member of the cat family. Whoops, sorry, I keep getting my buttons wrong here. Um, it is actually this cat. This is a Eurasian lynx. They are a little bit different than the Canadian lynx that we have here in North America. Eurasian lynx live in the boreal forests and in the Arctic tundra regions of places like Sweden. And those paws, those giant paws, act like snowshoes that a human would wear. They help to spread the weight of the lynx over top of the snow so that they don't sink in so deep when they're walking or running around. If you've ever tried to break a path through a fresh snowfall, you know how much energy that takes, right? So by staying on top of the snow, the lynx is using less energy to get around. So that is a very important body part adaptation that helps them survive in their Arctic habitats. One more to show you. What? Polar animal do you think this came from? This one's a little trickier. It's I'm, I'm trying to come back in. My computer is doing weird things to me. This one is much trickier considering that it's a completely vague pile of white. Lindsay, you're tricking us. Yeah. You're trying to just mess it up. <laughs> Miss Fisher's class, what do you think this? Polar bear, everyone's saying polar bear, holy. I'm seeing polar bear in the chat as well. Excellent uh, guesses. 
but it isn't. It's actually an animal that lives in Antarctica. Those polar bears are in the Arctic. This is Antarctic. And it is, in fact, the belly feathers of a penguin. And this is an Adili penguin. And I just love this photograph so much. This is the happiest little penguin I've ever seen in my entire life. So you have all probably seen videos of penguins tobogganing on their bellies. That is a behavioral adaptation that does the same thing that the lynx's giant feet do. It helps to spread the penguin's weight over the surface of the snow so they are using less energy getting around. But the feathers actually perform a very important function as well. When the penguin's going forward, head first, those feathers are very smooth and very slick and they help it to slip over the surface of the snow so they can move a little more easily. But if the penguin starts to slide backwards or tail first, the feathers actually dig in like tiny little crampons and they help to anchor the penguin, which is really helpful when they are tobogganing uphill against the forces of gravity. It keeps them from sliding back down. Now, I couldn't put the experiments in the book, but the experiments that scientists did to study how penguins move and when they walk and when they toboggan are wackadoodle. They are some of the most amazing experiments I have ever read in my entire life. If you want to know more about that, there's a whole blog post on my website about them, and that link will be in the resources for this talk, so you can check that out later. Okay, excellent work, everybody. So all of the habitat challenges that we have talked about so far occur in habitats outside of the polar regions as well. It gets really cold in the boreal forest. It gets really dry in the deserts. It gets really windy in Florida during a hurricane. The polar regions are special because they have all of those things together, plus one more. The polar regions have a thing that nowhere else on Earth has, and that is very extreme changes in the length of the day, okay? Remember I said earlier I lived in Yellowknife. Yellowknife is at 62 north latitude, okay? That's just below the Arctic Circle. And when I was a kid, I had to go to school in the dark and I had to come home in the dark because the sun was only up for about two or three hours in the middle of the day when it was January. If you keep going farther north towards the pole or south towards the other pole, those changes in day length become even more extreme until you get to the poles themselves, where there's one day per year that lasts for six months, and there's one night per year, and it lasts the other six months. So polar animals have to have a special adaptation for dealing with this very extreme change in the amount of light that they get. So what I'm gonna do now is to read a small section of the book to you that will um, help explain how this adaptation works, okay? And coincidentally, this adaptation is described in the spread for May in the book, and it's May right now, so it works out perfectly. Keeping time. Animals have circadian rhythms, internal clocks that tell them the best time of day or night to eat, sleep, or move throughout their habitats. In most parts of the world, these clocks are synchronized to daily cycles of light and dark. Polar animals, however, need flexible clocks to help them make the most of the midnight sun or survive the polar night. Arctic. It's spring in the high Arctic islands of Svalbard and the midnight sun has been shining for weeks. In bare patches between melting snowbanks, buttercups and saxifrage and hairy horsewort are already growing. Their swelling buds paint the tundra with specks of living color. With their flexible circadian rhythms, Reindeer are taking full advantage of this fresh food. They graze around the clock, heads bobbing up and down, clipping sweet blossoms and tender new shoots. Deer that have filled their stomachs lie down to digest, chewing their cud like cattle. Some close their eyes, snatching a nap between meals. It won't be long, however, before they're back on their hooves and eating again. Calves will be born any day now, and summer's bounty is short-lived. The reindeer must eat all they can, fattening up before the sun sets and snow covers this tundra garden once more. Antarctica. Bransfield Strait, off the Antarctic Peninsula, is too far north to experience polar night, but winter's still coming, each day shorter and grayer than the last, especially when heavy snow clouds filter what's left of the afternoon light. All summer, krill surfaced at sunset eating floating algae when daytime predators couldn't see them. 
At dawn, they dove to feed on the seabed, hiding from hunters in the darker, deeper water. But as the season shifted, the krill's internal clocks lost control. Now, their daily movements are only loosely linked to the sun's rise and fall. Instead, krill respond to the brightness of the light, no matter where it comes from. Today's sun is set, the light faded. The swarm of krill begins to ascend. But the storm clouds break just as the full moon is rising. In the sudden glare, these werewolf plankton flinch and pause, waiting for darkness to continue their journey in safety. Okay. We are about to transition into deleted scenes, some of my favorite facts that did not make it into the book, but I just wanted to pause again for one moment to see if there are any questions before we change gears. Well, I will just say that was beautifully read. Thank you very much. And I, again, not just May, we've had the chance to feature May because we're in May now, which is very exciting. And spring is springing here in, in Newfoundland, but uh, all the seasons are represented here. There's some incredible story if you want to check out more of that. And in lieu of questions now, hold on to those guys and we'll dive in soon. We're at the 26 minute marks. So we've got cahoots coming up soon. We've got questions. You've got all the interactivity, Lindsay. I'm very excited. But <laughs> deleted scenes. I'm most excited for deleted scenes. Deleted scenes. Okay. Let's just dive right ahead then. Um, we'll start with the first one, which is about Greenland sharks. Okay. As you probably guessed, Greenland sharks live in the oceans in the Arctic. And they are a really cool species. Um, first of all, they are very, very slow swimmers. So Greenland sharks go about 0.17 meters per second. In comparison, a great white shark goes 0.85 meters per second. That's quite a bit faster. Second thing that's really cool about them is that they have incredibly slow life cycles. A female Greenland shark has to be 150 years old before she can have babies. Humans don't even live that long. That is incredible all by itself. And in fact, scientists believe that Greenland sharks are the longest living vertebrates, animals with backbones, of any species on the planet. They found one Greenland shark that was 6.4 meters long, and they estimated that it was 272 years old. All of that is astonishing and amazing, but it's not the thing I was going to share. Now, this next photo I'm going to show you is a little bit gross. So anybody who is a little squeamish, you may want to close your eyeballs right now because we're about to show you an eyeball thing and it's, it's gross. It's amazing, but it's gross. Okay. Most Greenland sharks are infected with parasites that attach to their eyeballs and dangle in the water as they're swimming. And those wormy parasites can be up to six centimeters long. Ew. I know. Ew. <laughs> Ew. I know. I know. Um, and if you're like me, you're wondering, <laughs> how is this possibly like something that the sharks can survive? How are they finding food if they can't see because worms have destroyed their eyeballs? Well, when scientists were studying the brains of the Greenland sharks, they realized that the part of the brain that is devoted to the sense of smell is huge. And the part of the brain devoted to sight is really, really tiny, which makes a lot of sense, right? These are sharks that live in the Arctic. It's dark a lot of the year. They're swimming in deep, dark water where the sunlight can't penetrate. Often there's ice on top of that water, which is blocking even more of the light. So probably they were never really using their eyes that much anyway. And that is how they have been able to survive despite being infected with the really gross worms. Now, if you had your eyes closed, it's totally safe to open them again. I have changed the picture and you are looking at something much cuter now. <laughs> We are now looking at walruses. These are Pacific walruses. They are also an Arctic species. They are the largest members of the seal family. Unlike the Greenland sharks, they do look for food with their eyeballs. They are usually foraging in shallow water where there is still some light. And mostly what they eat are mollusks and other types of shellfish that are on the ocean floor and they're buried in sand. So they have three different ways of finding the mollusks under the sand. First thing that they do is actually feel around with their whiskers. You can see those lovely mustaches they both have on. The second thing they will do is they will shoot a jet of water out of their mouths to sort of blast away the sand and uncover the shellfish. But most often what they do is fan with their flippers. 
And as you can see, I am fanning with my right flipper because scientists discovered that 89% of the time, that is the flipper that the walruses were using. They did not see any walruses that preferred to use their left flipper. Now, to be fair, there were only about a dozen walruses in this study. So we're not actually sure whether there are no lefties or if we just haven't found them because they're less common as they are in humans. But something about the fact that walruses have a preferred hand, just like humans do, totally tickled me. I loved this fact so much. And I was a little sad that I could put it in the book. That's why it's on my blog. All the good stuff goes on my blog after, after I have put the best stuff in the book. Okay, I'm gonna share one more deleted scene with you here. And that has to do with Antarctic ice fish, which are so cool. So these are an Antarctic species and there are numbers of species actually. There's a whole family of different species of ice fish. And remember we talked a little bit earlier about how gills are an adaptation for getting the oxygen out of the water when you're a fish. Well, in most vertebrates, those species with the backbones, once the oxygen gets inside the gills of the lungs, it attaches to hemoglobin molecules inside our red blood cells. And then the red blood cells carry the oxygen all the way through our bodies so that it can interact with food and turn into energy, right? Ice fish do not have hemoglobin. Their blood is white. Amazing. But a consequence of that <laughs> is that it's harder for them to get the energy throughout their whole bodies because the oxygen's not moving as efficiently as it does in animals that have red blood cells. So they tend to be very slow moving like Greenland sharks and they tend to ambush their prey instead of chasing after it because chasing uses too much energy. Again, all of which is very cool, very amazing. Not the thing I wanted to share. The thing I wanted to share is this quote from a scientific study, an actual scientific study. And I'll read it out loud because some of the words are Latin. The first species of the family Chinichthidae was initially described from the Erebus and Terror expedition to the Southern Ocean in 1844 as Chinichthus rhinoceratus by Richardson, 1844, but was renamed shortly afterwards in Chinichthus rhinoceratus. A second ice fish species, possibly C. antarcticus, was eaten by the ship's cat before it could be properly cataloged. I read this, I laughed for three days straight. <laughs> and someday I'm gonna write an entire book about all the times the cats have ruined science because of course they did. <laughs> I love it so much. Okay, that's it for deleted scenes for right now. And I know we're running close to time when it's to do the Kahoot. So I'm gonna leave you all with a question that I would like you to think about and discuss with your classmates and consider for the future here. We talked earlier about the way adaptations are a match between the animal and its habitat, but we also know that polar habitats are changing. So here's what I want you to think about. As their habitats change, will the adaptations of polar animals still help them to survive? Are there specific adaptations that might work better? if the habitat changes in certain ways? Are there adaptations that might actually hurt the animal's chance of surviving? Can you think of specific examples either way? Something to ponder um, after the talk today. Thanks. Okay. Lindsay, this has been so much fun. I know we could talk about this all day, but we want to leave stuff in the book for people to explore when they're done. And I'll make sure they have the link to all of that too. Um, I just want you guys to consider that. This is something that keeps coming up in a lot of polar programs, with scientists, authors, and the like. Uh, mm -hmm. And a lot of kids have already spent a lot of time thinking about this. If the Q&A is any indication, these kids could actually have written the book as well. So <laughs> they're like on the ball today, which is amazing. Um, folks, we are going to dive in with our Kahoot. Uh, a lot of you were in and left. You can come on back in now. Our game pin is 569 one five nine nine we're going to do a quick three question quiz together uh for those who are new to this the faster you answer the more points you get and what you win is lindy and i's everlasting respect right that you oh, get yeah. attention 
and you were fantastic and we're excited to have you take part. Uh, and then we're going to dive in with questions. And as Lindsay said, I'm going to share all the resources about her website, Kids Can Press, the other amazing stuff that you guys can do at the end of the broadcast. And if classes don't have individual devices and you just want to play along, that is totally fine too. But I'm going to get us underway with our first question and uh, we can get started. Let's see. All right. Uh, three, two, one. Okay. Question one. Adaptations can be, we had this question at the very beginning, if you were paying close attention, is it body parts, body functions, behaviors, or all of the above? Hmm. What do we think, everybody? Uh, get those answers in. If there's more than one of you, oh, we're shy. <laughs> we had like 15 of you in the cahoot like minutes ago, and they all left just before. They didn't, didn't wait to oh, yeah. again. So our, our one answer is all of the above, and that is the correct answer. So you are absolutely killing it. Uh, Diplomat Tiger, you are the boss. Awesome. Way to go. All right, we're going to dive into question number two. Uh, and then I'm going to head to our uh, Glenview, Illinois, Africa West class for our first question, Ms. Fisher. Saturnalia, you guys have, have come in now, which is great. Uh, Antarctica gets more snow than the Arctic. What do we think? Yes, or vrai or faux, as the mm. would say. By the way, you mentioned Yellowknife. We just did a program right before you with Land of the Ancestors in Parks Canada talking about the amazing parks up there. It's Fantastic. very exciting. All right. Yeah. Our answer is false. It's, we, we knew the Arctic got more snow. It was the one thing that stopped us from being a complete sweep for Antarctica. So way to go with that. Awesome. I like Diplomat Tiger's chances here going into question number three. I think it's up. <laughs> the following animals is right flippered. Now, I like to put fake images for these to trick people, but today I was feeling very nice. And so we just covered this. Oh, two answers now. They're coming in. They're coming in. <laughs> Three answers. Could be an upset. We have a leaderboard. A deli, chin strap, walrus, or ice fish. The answer is our Pacific walrus friend. Yes. We, we want it to be the ice fish and penguin, apparently, as well. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we know our leaderboard winner. Thank you for participating in our Kahoot folks. If you want to let us know who you are in the chat, please do. We'd love to hear from you. And what we're gonna do now is dive in with Q&A. There's been some great yeah. questions in the chat too. YouTubers, you guys can share there as well. Um, Miss Fisher's class, I'm gonna come to you guys first from Carsonville. <laughs> Did they win the Kahoot? I think so. <laughs> You guys are crazy. I love it. So, do you have any questions for Lindsay? <laughs> I'll, I'll come back. I'll let you guys be energetic, and I'll have to glend you for a minute for a question. Um, hi. I wanted to ask a question. Um, how do you stay focused on the same book for all this time? I really like writing books, but a problem is I can never finish one. I'm always like, oh, I have this new idea. How about I go write it? And then this one's stuck in my drafts. Yeah, yeah, this is this is a very good question. And honestly, it's a challenge. <laughs> um, because especially if you're the kind of person like I am and you love to learn new things and you're constantly being distracted by some new, shiny, interesting thing over here that has nothing to do with what you are working on. So for me it's a couple of things one of them is that my editor is very good at keeping me focused and on track so if i start to wander off she will point that out and she'll bring me back and say okay let's let's deal with this first save that for the next book um the second thing is even though it takes four years to write the book i don't work on the one book for four years straight i usually have two or three different projects that are sort of in different stages all the time. So for example, I'll get one draft and I will write the first draft and I'll send it off to my editor so that she can look at it and come back to me with questions. And while I'm waiting for her, which can take some you know, months because she's working on lots of books at the same time, um, then I will start on something else. And that helps me um, get a little bit of a break and also allows me to indulge my curiosity on other topics while I am uh, still making forward progress on things that are important. So it's it's okay to work on more than one thing at a time. Yep. 
but it's also really important to finish what you start and finding that balance is tricky for sure. <laughs> I'm so glad that was our first question. I, I, think I expected a lot of polar bear stuff and I'm really glad we got a really detailed stuff on being an author. So thank you for that. Guys. Great question. Uh, this Fisher's class, calm to get out from the celebration. Uh, do you have a question for us? Hey guys. <laughs> Hi there. We had a question that was, how do you like select the topics? We You said that you were interested in lots of different things, but how do you narrow it down and decide which things you're going to research and write about? Yeah. yeah, that is a tricky question too, because I am excited about pretty much everything, <laughs> as you probably guessed. So first of all, it has to be a topic that I care enough about that I can spend four years working on it. If it's something that I find a little bit interesting, I'm not gonna write a book about it because I just can't maintain my enthusiasm for that much time. So I try to pick the book projects and the topics that I care so deeply about that I'm gonna still love it in four years from now when I finally finish it. Um, and then when it comes to deciding what's gonna go in the book, what's gonna get cut from the book, that is a much more complicated process of just deciding what is this book really about and what are the best examples and the most interesting facts that I can bring in to talk about this topic and what do I need to say for another time. And it's a process that does take several drafts and narrowing down over and over and over again. Um, so yeah, it's it's not straightforward at all. <laughs> Fantastic question, guys. All right, time flies and we're having fun. So we're gonna take three more questions before you wrap up together and I'll be sure to pass along all the resources to keep learning going when you're done. Mm -hmm. um, our Saturna Island folks, BC, I'm sorry you've been having tech issues, but they wanna know, Mm -hmm. Of the types of adaptations you listed, so these like body parts, functions, or whatever, is there one of them that animals find the most hard to make changes for to account for temperature change? Was the climate's warming? Ooh. Is one of those is like the limiting factor? Would it be body parts? Because it's hard oh. to that's behavior yeah. readily. This is a really good question. So there's a couple of factors that come into play here. So if we're talking about one animal adapting to a change that it encounters in its habitat, that's not adaptation in the evolutionary sense. That's more learning from experience, right? So an animal can learn to change its behaviors depending on what it encounters in its environment, just the way humans do, right? You know, trial and error, we figure stuff out. Um, when it comes to adaptations in the sense of evolution, the things that have been selected for that create that initial match between the animal and its habitat. Um, there's some evidence from paleontology that suggests that behavior may actually change first and behavior could be the thing that eventually results in changes in the body parts. Changing the, the shape of the body takes longer. Yeah. Um, so for example, whales used to be hoofed animals that walked around on land and then eventually um, evolved and became whales back in the ocean. Um, and one of the first steps that the paleontologist thinks may have happened is that the tiny little hoofed mammal was running into the water to hide from predators. Mm. And so it had to spend more time finding food in the water instead of food in the land. And then because it had changed its behavior and it was eating different foods, eventually that created a selective pressure that changed the shape of its teeth to match its new food. So it seems to be behavior first, body parts last. Yes. Yeah. So challenging and a detailed question. I appreciate the nuance. And I will say that the evolution of whales is one of the coolest things fossil-wise ever. Uh, some of the scariest things to ever exist uh, are fossil whales. So I encourage you to check that out. Uh, yeah. Out of West, grade fours, if you guys want to come back in for a second question, I know you share one in the chat too. So a student comes up, I can bring it up. But I know you'd mentioned what predators eat the walrus, and I do love that question very much. So if you want to oh, oh, excellent question. Yeah, walruses are absolutely enormous. Um, I think a male walrus, a male Pacific walrus, can be more than twelve hundred kilograms, which is absolutely huge. So the only thing that is going to attempt to take on a walrus is either a, a killer whale, an yeah. orca possibly a polar bear, but it would have to be a desperate polar bear. A polar bear would be more likely to go after a baby walrus rather than an adult. Oh, Jesse has information. Okay. <laughs> I, have a, I have a sneak peek too. I just encourage our kids to look up Wrangell Island where like there's like 
a ridiculous amount of bears and a ridiculous amount of walruses. And there's this yeah. whole ecosystem of like really intense bears and really intense walruses. And it's a very scary and cool place at the same time. So, but yes, those are our two apex predators on land and the ocean, really. The polar bear is like the ultimate thing on land. There's nothing that beats an orca. Orcas are like, orcas are so scary. They take out blue whales and great white sharks. So like nothing messes with orcas at all. They are... Well, orcas hunt in teams as well, right? So it's a solo polar bear or a team of orcas. And whenever animals are hunting together, they usually succeed <laughs> more than if they're hunting apart. Yeah. We had a student at Africa West come up right after I heard that. So share away. Hey. Hi. Um, what animal do you find the most interesting? Ooh, no pressure. Ooh. Ooh. Jesse, can, can we bring back the uh, slideshow? I sure can. Here it is. <laughs> Voila. <laughs> I was hoping someone would ask. This is my bonus slide. <laughs> um, so I love all of the animals. Honestly, as soon as I start research, I completely fall in love with everything that I'm learning about. But this has got to be one of the best things I have ever read. And I was so happy that I did manage to fit this into the book because there are seabirds that protect themselves from predators with projectile vomit. They eat fish and krill and other ocean critters, and in their stomachs, it turns into this really concentrated, awful, horrible, sticky, fishy smelling goo that they will then vomit onto whatever is attacking them. And that oil will destroy the protective coating of the feathers on whatever bird it just attacked. And then the bird can actually freeze to death if it gets wet, like when it's resting on the surface of the water. So this is like an amazing hardcore adaptation. It's just incredible. Um, and that YouTube link there will take you to a little Nova video <laughs> where you can see this in action. <laughs> I was just going to highlight, too, uh, Frozen Planet 2, which I just finished, has an incredible sequence around this uh, thing in action. It is really freaky and weird, and so lots of opportunity to see the gross vomiting in action. The gross vomiting. <laughs> we're going to take two more, one from each class, and then we're going to let everybody go. We know folks are off for the end of the day soon, but Miss Fisher first, mm -hmm. and then Saturnalia. I'm going to take one of your questions from the chat right after that. Miss Fisher, hey. Randy. Elijah, come here. Okay. Randy. Is it? Is it? Randy. Do your green land sharks swim all day in the night? Do um green Greenland Greenland sharks swim, swim all day and night? Nice. Ooh, ooh, excellent question. Um, and now I may have this wrong because it's a little while since I did this research. So I'm going to encourage you all to go do your own research afterwards and check my facts. But I believe that Greenland sharks, like other sharks, have the cool thing where only half of their brain is asleep at a time and that allows them to keep swimming um, even while they're asleep. Now, again, double check because it's been a while since I looked at that specific fact and I may have it wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's true. <laughs> so certain sharks, a lot of people know this. Most people, when they think sharks, they think they always have to keep swimming to survive. There are some sharks that don't. They've got a special adaptation that allows them to sit on the bottom. Like nurse sharks are like this. If you go to aquarium, you'll see nurse sharks lying on the bottom. Yep. They can pass water over their gills. Greenland sharks are not like that. They're called ram ventilators, so they do have to keep swimming to survive. And the way they do that is, as Lindsay said, turn off part of their brain at a time, which sometimes you guys do in class. That's why we try and bring these Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants programs. So you don't have to ever turn off part of your brain in any lesson. Um, <laughs> one more question from us, Turn Island. Avika West, thanks, Blendview. I know you have to go. Um, they wanted to know, ooh, are polar birds adapted to be very clever like crows and ravens in order to survive adverse conditions? Or do they have to survive, do they have to have a biological priority in adaptation to survive? So are they really smart? Do they have to have cool features? What's the deal? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what? Evolution is always a balancing act, right? There's always the whole animal is being um, selected at the same time. So all of those adaptations kind of balance out and sometimes there have to be compromises that are made. Um, now, again, it's been a while since I looked at that specific bit of research. So I do encourage you to, uh, to do your own research and check this. But I believe that the birds that stay in the polar regions all year round actually have bigger brains than the ones that migrate because they are dealing with a wider range of conditions in their habitat and they have to have different strategies for dealing with that. So ravens are one of those birds that stays in the Arctic all year round. And I'm pretty sure that is true. But once again, double check because it's been a while. 
My favorite uh, is a relative of the raven crows. There's a Russian video of a crow taking a piece of like particle board and surfing down a roof just repeatedly for fun, which they're that intelligent. We've also seen crows grab nuts, put them under car tires at red lights so that the car will run over the nut to crack it and then it gets the stuff inside, which is brilliant and very, very cool. Yeah. Lindsay, we could go all day. I'm going to share uh, all the resources with all our registered classes. We've got groups joining us from across North America and beyond. So a big thank you to Illinois, to Michigan, to BC and beyond. Thank you all so, so much for joining today, everyone. Miss Fisher's class, I'm going to bring you back in live as our, our remaining audio working enthusiastic class du jour. Bring that Kahoot energy. Lindsay, thank you so much for all this. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Yeah.